So today, you know, I'm going to just introduce the um, uh, Chinese architecture in general, and also give you um, some understanding of the uh, this class. Um, this class is called the history of Chinese architecture, but we are going to focus mostly on traditional Chinese architecture uh, because I have a separate course which is called uh, Modern Chinese Architecture and that is Architecture 2020. So this is called History of Chinese Architecture <coughs> but we mostly cover um, Chinese architecture before the 19th century that is a traditional Chinese architecture. Um, and we might have one last lecture for the 19th and the 20th century, 21st century, uh, basically the modern Chinese architecture after the Opium War. Um, so we, um, that's one thing I wanted to clarify. Um, so we are focusing more on the, the old stuff, um, something that might be considered classical or vernacular um, ethnic um, Chinese architecture. Um, and we will have a kind of a more or less chronological way to organize the course material, just like the way uh, your main textbook um, is uh, the way that book is, is or organized. However, I, um, I will try to kind of put um, a specific lecture in a chronological order, but also try to highlight some, um, some key issue um, in traditional Chinese architecture. So it will be both chronological and, um, and thematic, right? Um, well, my computer indicate I have some microphone issue. Uh, do you hear me okay? So can someone just uh, tell me, can you hear my voice okay? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, all right, thank you. So my, for some reason, my computer says there is a microphone issue. Let me just double check um, on the sound. Okay, turn on microphone. It looks, looks all right. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Sorry about that. Um, So now, <clears throat> so when I say um, traditional Chinese architecture, and um, you know, we might want to reflect reflect on that a little. So when we when we say Chinese architecture. Chinese versus what? And when we say traditional architecture, traditional versus what? So does anyone have any thought about that? So if you want to respond, you can unmute yourself. So Chinese versus what? Um, someone wanted to fill in the blanks. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, when I think of traditional Chinese architecture, I think of architecture that is meant like imperial architecture or um, 
architecture where you go to like reflect or like practice your like you know like religious practices and those type of things as opposed to maybe like vernacular architecture or like residential architecture like that or like business architecture okay so um <clears throat> so traditional here means here it's um um your understanding it's kind of more official more imperial um and as opposed to um like versus you mentioned residential right okay um anyone else like you know just to use um maybe one word chinese versus something it's a, an opposite or it's kind of different How about Chinese versus like, um, like, uh, like more architecture or like Spanish architecture? Okay, Chinese versus Spanish. Um, that's a good. That's a that's a good one. So it's kind of a in this case like Chinese uh, represent a national national style. If, is that what you are saying? Kind of more nationality versus yeah. Spanish. Also, yeah. And so like I mentioned uh, Spanish architecture because there's a history of like different um, nations under that rule. And so they bring different forms of architecture and different cultures. Whereas China, it seems like, you know, the ones, you know, the standard of Chinese building has been preserved through history. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, thank you. Um, any other thought? Um, like, I guess. Mm -hmm. oh. Go ahead. I guess the immediate thought after seeing these images would be um, like the one on the left is more commonly found like throughout East Asia because like China had a lot of influence on other countries there, whereas the image on the right shows like a more Western style. Mm -hmm. so it's like it's it's common in multiple countries, but towards like the Western side of the continent, not like okay. largely China. Yeah, um, good. So um, you are saying, you know, when we hear Chinese architecture, we might immediately something came to our thought, um, you know, Chinese versus Western, like these two image are kind of uh, um, presenting um, Chinese versus Western. Good. All right. Now, um, the second half, traditional versus something, right? Any, <clears throat> anyone want to just, just use one word, traditional versus something, use one word. Any, any proposal? Modern. Traditional versus modern. Um, I like that. Um, traditional versus modern. And um, any like thought about it? Wh why did you um, make this kind of juxtaposition or this kind of um, dichotomy of traditional versus modern? Can you- like, I, I think a, a lot of times, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think a lot of times classes are are taught in that way where like you have the history aspect of it and then um, kind of the what are we doing now aspect of it. Um, and I think modern in a lot of ways uh, diverges from tradition and that's like part of the word itself um, is that it is divergent. Uh, so that's I think why that dichotomy kind of appears mm -hmm. in my mind at least. Good, good. Um, so <clears throat> uh, indeed, this is often, you know, the way we, um, we look, at, look at the world. And I'm not saying um, whether it is right or wrong, it's um, product productive or impoverishing, but that's, um, 
often, very often, the way we analyze things and we look at the world, traditional versus modern. <laughs> so now look at the, <clears throat> um, look at the, 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 the captions for these images. On the left is the Forbidden City. Um, the Forbidden City was built in the early 15th century. So it's a, a 600 year old and it is, it fit into our iconic um, understanding of Chinese architecture. And it is, it is traditional, uh, right? No problem. It's both Chinese, it is, it is traditional. Now look at the one on the right. It's Western in style, but look at where it is located. It is located in Shanghai and um, <clears throat> it, is definitely, um, it is definitely not, not modern. Um, it is in the kind of a Renaissance revival style. Um, it's like the, um, it could be something built in the 19th century in New York or in London or in, in practically any part of the world. <laughs> so um, that image starts to look a little bit kind of a deconstructive to our understanding of Chinese versus Western, traditional versus modern, all right? Because on one hand, it is the, uh, a bank. Um, it's the um, Shanghai and Hong Kong Bank of China, um, known as the Huifeng Bank uh, in, in Chinese. It is a British company um, and it was established in Shanghai and doing business specifically in, the, uh, in East Asia. It has branches in Hong Kong. Um, so it, it is on the Chinese soil on one hand, but it does not fit into our iconic understanding of Chinese architecture. It is built in the modern period completed in 1923, but it is certainly not, not that modern, all right? So when something like that appear, it forced us to think more deeply about those dichotomies, those understandings. Um, it also forced us to think about what does modern mean on the Chinese soil? Does it mean westernization? Um, or uh, what is the kind of a deep layers of, of mo modernization? And that of course <clears throat> helped to, um, to define our under, understanding of both Chineseness and uh, what does it mean by traditional, right? So I just want to um, present the first slide, the very first slide for the for the whole class um, <coughs> about the the meaning of words. Um, all right, we we use words for communication but we should also be uh, critical, be mindful about the possible uh, confusion and a possible kind of a, um, loaded meaning uh, in those words like, the Chin like Chinese, like traditional. So, let's see. All right. Now, um, another thing I wanted to mention that today when we talk about China, China we often um, automatically think about 
a map, a modern kind of a political map with its own border. So today, this is the border of China. Um, and, um, and when we think about um, Chinese architecture, we will um, automatically have images like this or the previous forbidden, forbidden city. So <clears throat> there's nothing wrong about it. But again, we should be critical because when we start looking at history, everything become more complicated because in the past, the border of China um, had been always in flux, right? It changes. Um, the China 3000 years ago, its border, its definition, what, what count as China, what does not count as China is very different from today. So that's another thing we should be mindful. Um, and uh, because within the modern border of China, there are a lot of cultures that are actually closer to the neighboring country, neighboring cultures, than to something like this, um, like Chinese architecture. If you look at architecture in this part of China, um, the Xinjiang province, this is the uh, Muslim province of China, and uh, its architecture is closer to the architecture for example, in Pakistan or in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc. Um, if you if we look at this part of China, which is um, the the Tibetan region, then its architecture um, is more similar to the architecture, for example, in Nepal or in Bhutan. Um, so same as the southwestern part, um, their architectural tradition is closely integrated with the cultures of, of Myanmar, and that is Burma, uh, Burmese architecture or Thai architecture in Thailand, uh, etc. So that is also um, uh, kind of complicated because in history, some part of those um, regions um, might have been belonging to the same country as a, as a part of the, um, the earth that does not belong to China today, uh, but in the past, they used to be um, the, under the same regime or under the same uh, kingdom or empire. All right, that's another thing I want to draw your attention um, to, to be critical to the term we use, we use China, especially when we apply it to history, then uh, we need, we have to go back to that, um, to that era we are, we are discussing and, um, and to, um, in order to understand um, how that part of the earth was contextualized um, politically and culturally, um, say, 2000 years ago. All right. <clears throat> so this is clearly shown in this kind of ethnic map of, of modern China. So in this ethnic map of modern China, um, only the orange part of the map, uh, let me see, I'm going to use this, uh, use the pen. All right, only the orange part um, of the map are primarily occupied by people who speak Chinese. The rest of them are um, 
you know, speaking different language, uh, they have different religion, and the also, they are also ethnically more kind of a um, uh, independent um, from what we consider as uh, quote unquote Chinese. For example, this this part, this um, kind of a light brown, this is the Mongolian area, and this color indicate uh, the Mongolian region, and the southern part today belong to. Um, the People's Republic of China, but the northern part um, is the independent country of the Mongolian Republic. And then there are also some Mongolian region today, they belong to Russia, right? So, um, and this kind of a purple region, these are the Uyghur um, people. The Uyghur um, is a kind of a Turkic uh, speaking people. They speak a language um, called Uyghur, uh, which is uh, uh, very close to uh, Turkish um, language. So it's, they are kind of Turks historically. You know, 2000 years ago, um, they were all kind of uh, Turks. Um, in this part of the world. And uh, there are also some Mongolians um, in the Xinjiang province. And then this yellow color indicate the Tibetan uh, region. So these are Tibetans. And there are numerous kind of small little dots uh, indicate those smaller ethnic groups uh, like the Burmese um, connected um, ethnic groups in um, northern Yunnan province um, in southwest part of China, and there were also Thai related ethnic groups in southern part of Yunnan province. So this is like this is the Yunnan province in southwest China. And then you also find um, some red dots within the um, Chinese area, um, this orange area, by the way, the people, the Chinese who speak Chinese are called the Han, right? H-A-N, the Han people, the Han Chinese. So the Han Chinese are the Chinese who actually speak Chinese. And sometimes you might find in the English um, literature, they call this area China proper, right? So like this is China proper, this is um, China expanded, uh, something like that. So there are different colors even within China proper um, or the Han Chinese region. For example, this red dot, these are um, Chinese Muslim living among the Chinese majority, living among the Han Chinese people. So these Muslims, today they are called the Hui, um, the Hui ethnic group, um, H-U-I, Hui ethnic group. So these Muslims, <clears throat> unlike the Uyghur, they already um, have been uh, sinicized, right? So they speak Chinese. These are like the Muslim, Chinese Muslim known as the Hui ethnic group who speak Chinese. They are Chinese speaking Muslims and they are descendants um, from those uh, immigrants from Central Asia, from the Arabian region who were brought to China by Genghis Khan, for example. Um, you know, 600 years ago. And um, they live among the Chinese and gradually they adopted the uh, Chinese language. And, uh, but their religious identity was preserved. So they became culturally quite different from the rest of the Chinese, even though they were um, highly sinicized. Um, they speak 
they speak Chinese. They were no longer speaking Persian or Arabic language. Um, so these are known as Hui. And then there are dots of other colors who became an ethnic minority in China due to specific historical reasons, historical circumstances. So it's complicated. So that brought us to this question again, Chinese versus what, right? Now, you know, if we define Chinese-ness more culturally as something um, like the, how do I, yeah, okay. Like something like this, then Chinese could also, um, you know, versus any of these colors different from this um, orange majority, right? It could be Chinese versus West, China, Chinese versus Spanish. It could also be Chinese versus Uyghur or Chinese versus Tibetan or Chinese versus Mongolian or Chinese versus Hui or any of these different color, no matter how small they are, right? So, um, so that's another thing I want to um, make clear about in the very beginning of the class. In another word, we are not going to cover entire China in this class we will have a focus. And your textbook has a focus. Your textbook does not cover, um, you know, much Mongolian or Tibetan or Uyghur architecture. It primarily focus on um, China proper. And it also primarily focus on what we consider as the kind of classical Han culturally Chinese architecture. In another word, it is a very um, limited um, look onto the architectural heritage of China. So we should be mindful about that. Uh, in another word, there are much to do in architectural history um, so now I'm encouraging you guys to consider a career as an architectural historian because even though there are a lot of writing, a lot of books published on Chinese architecture, there are still a vast sea of unknown knowledge waiting to be recovered and especially regarding the past of those regions that had been neglected or understudied. Um, so, um, <clears throat> and um, that's how we, um, that's how we uh, understand um, our past and ourself. Um, so we always want to, to recover the unknown knowledge and there are much to be uncovered. Uh, in the field of Chinese architectural history. So, um, so in another word, there is a kind of cultural diversity, um, cultural diversity in Chinese architecture um, because of that map, right? Because, you know, there is a Han Chinese and there are also many local style, many ethnic group, even just within the Han Chinese region, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of different regional style. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> what we might consider as the kind of a um, classical Chinese architecture is more closely tied to um, architecture like this. Um, this is a courtyard house in Beijing and um, um, it is the prototype of temple, palace um, 
and shrines, um, etc., uh, in traditional Chinese architecture. So that belonged to the classics. However, it is primarily based on the northern um, China proper. And even within China proper, there is a regional diversity. For example, in southeastern part of China, um, their residential architecture uh, in, in, in one region looks more like this. So it, it is circular. Um, it, it is also multi-family, uh, collective kind of a castle-like um, building. It's uh, also uh, multi-story. Well, the Beijing um, courtyard dwelling, known as the Si He Yuan, is primarily just one story, um, square in shape, and using courtyard to organize the space, and using multi courtyard to define different layers of privacy. Uh, while the this building, which is located in the southeastern Fujian province. It is circular, multi-story, multi-family, and uh, just one big courtyard. Um, and um, the rooms are uh, divided like those slices of, of pizza. So it's, it's very different. And this is considered in within China proper, all right? But still there are regional diversity that is not represented by the official style, um, um, like the Beijing courtyard or the Forbidden City, which is basically a supersized um, um, courtyard. <clears throat> and um, um, yeah, this is just another image showing how the look from exterior and this is the uh, Beijing Courtyard House, and this is the Hakka Earth Tower from Fujian Province. Um, this is from interior, All right? I'm just using this one pair of examples to show the difference. Um, the interior of the courtyard of the Beijing uh, Si He Yuan and the interior of this Hakka um, Earth Tower, um, you know, from, from inside. And um, <clears throat> the regional diversity, of course, goes um, way beyond that. Um, so as I mentioned, once we set our eyes on the um, entire map of modern China, we will notice greater diversity. For example, I mentioned the Uyghur and their architecture look like this. So obviously this does not fit into our definition of Chinese architecture. It, it, is, it looks more similar to um, architecture in say Uzbekistan or um, or even Iran, right? And this one, this is an example of the Tibetan architecture. Um, it does not have those prominent sloping roofs. It does not have a timber frame with kind of red, red columns supporting brackets. It has a masonry wall and it has kind of a, that uh, unique um, color band um, and um, um, it looks like a castle um, elevated on a hilltop. Um, so Tibetan architecture is also very kind of um, obviously could be the word filled into the blank of Chinese versus a question mark, right? But, <clears throat> um, you know, we might just call all of them Chinese architecture. And that, of course, bring problem to the word Chinese Chinese. And the same thing will happen once we start looking at the detail of history, 
once we start looking at the um, um, the deep um, layers of what we are studying, we start to um, to find contradiction, find to discover um, those controversy. Um, so uh, this one is from southeastern part of China, um, you know, more from the Shanghai area, and even that area, its architecture is quite different from what we might consider as the kind of a classical official style. And this is from uh, kind of a middle southwest part of China. It belonged to an ethnic group that live among the Han Chinese, um, but does not have their own concentrated area like the Mongolians or Tibetans or Uyghur. Um, they are one of those small colorful dot within China proper and their architecture is also quite different. Uh, this is not a pagoda and it, it might look like a pagoda, but um, after this class, you will, you will see automatically that this is not a pagoda. It is very different from a pagoda formally, stylistically, and um, it be belong to a specific ethnic group and specific culture. Right. So, um, but still, when we talk about Chinese architecture, something like this will automatically jump into our mind. And um, um, part of the benefit of studying architectural history is to make our mind, of course, more sophisticated and make us more critical to every word. Um, we are about to, to speak. Uh, even though we still need to use those words to have a discussion, we are mindful about the pitfalls and we become critical to not only what we are reading, but also to ourselves, to the way we talk, to the way we, we discuss. Uh, we will uh, give a second thought to everything we are about to say, and that will actually uh, help, that will help for mutual understanding for, to avoid, to, uh, and to avoid uh, misunderstanding, to avoid com um, conflict. Because the very reason why a conflict um, might occur is because there are people who try to simplify things. They show you either black or white and force you to choose a position. And that often create um, conflict. But when we look at history, when we look deeper at reality, we find things are never so simplistic. Um, and uh, I think that is um, helpful uh, to our current situation as well. 